welcome everybody. I'm going to introduce our speaker in a moment, but first I want to turn it over to Karen to say a few words of welcome. Uh, welcome. It's great to see everybody back again. Uh, just a, a few words of, of thanks, um, first of all, to Rabbi Micah Streifer for the first three sessions on Spinoza. Uh, it's been um, challenging and difficult and fascinating and uh, and very thought provoking. And, and we, re we really appreciate the the enormous amount of work that you've put into this, Micah. It, it really shows. And, and I know uh, we've all really enjoyed it. Uh, just like to thank the other members of the Adult Ed Committee and our uh, Great Jewish Thinkers Subcommittee for for the work that that uh, that we've all put in to uh, to make these these series happen. And um, thank you to the anonymous donor who sponsored the four sessions on Spinoza, and also to all of you who made don donations to our Adult Ed Fund. Uh, much appreciated, and and we'll certainly continue to offer great programs. Um, we've got a summer series coming up, and then in the fall we'll pick up uh, we'll pick up with another great Jewish thinkers series or two uh, going forward. So um, thanks again, welcome, and Michael, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Karen, and and I want to echo all those thanks uh, to everybody who's been involved and everybody who has come and been taken part in these discussions. It's been so interesting and such a pleasure being part of this this learning, both this series and our Maimonides series earlier earlier this year. So it's my pleasure right now to introduce our speaker for this evening, Professor Michael Rosenthal. I'll read a bio that he sent me. Um, Professor or Michael A. Rosenthal holds the Grafstein Chair in Jewish Philosophy at the University of Toronto with appointments in the Department of Philosophy and the Anne Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies. He earned his undergraduate degree from Stanford University and his PhD in Philosophy at the University of Chicago. He also studied at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and the University of Haifa. He was formerly Professor of Philosophy and Jewish Studies at the University of Washington in Seattle. He is a co-editor of Spinoza's Theological Political Treatise, A Critical Guide, and is currently editing a volume on Spinoza and Modern Jewish Philosophy, which is forthcoming, and writing a book on Spinoza's political philosophy. He was recently a fellow in the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanitarian, sorry, in the Humanities at the Goethe University in Frankfurt where he gave the Martin Buber Lecture in Intellectual History and Philosophy. And it's really a pleasure to have you with us tonight, Professor Rosenthal. I also think it's worth pointing out that I think you've just survived your first Toronto winter, or was this your second Toronto winter? Well, you're muted right now, but uh, second Toronto winter. So then that makes you basically a local then. So welcome, oh, yeah, glad it. you're here. I want to thank you so much, Rabbi Streifer, for inviting me and uh, all of you for engaging with this difficult and interesting thinker. Um, I just want to get just jump right into it because I think it's exciting to have a chance to talk. I have prepared a bunch of slides, mainly um, that that looks at the theological political treatise. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I'm going to focus on that as the main uh, point for the lecture, um, partly because I think that it's often neglected. Um, to the um, to its detriment, I think it's a great text and super interesting, um, and I've been thinking a lot about it. Although, as I was just mentioning, I, I just spent the last semester teaching a, a graduate seminar at the U of T on the ethics, so I, I'm happy to talk about the ethics too. Um, I put a handout here in the chat, so if you want to download this, um, you're welcome. The handout just gives you all the quotes that I'm using. I want to put the quotes on the page, uh, both in the screen, and I'll share in a second, but also um, so you can see them, because I think that in our Jewish tradition, we want to look at what the thinkers say themselves. So we're paraphrasing them, we're making sense of them, but we also want to um, look at what they actually said and try to make sense of it. This text, I think, um, Theological Political Treatise is often quite, I think, is difficult, but clear in some ways in regard to what Spinoza thinks about these topics. Um, and I've, uh, so I want you to have them at hand. And even as I move forward through the slides, you, if you download this PDF file, you could then be able to see the quotes that, that were prior and you can take a look at it. So what I'm gonna do now is share my screen and I'm hoping that it works. 
Yeah, can everyone see it? So this is, you know, these are things you already know. I'm not gonna go spend a lot of time talking about Spinoza's life. I assume that you talked about his life a little bit. So I don't need to kind of go over some of the crucial things. Um, his background is really interesting and I can talk about the different ways. Oh no, now it's not. For some reason, it's not. Okay, here we go. Okay, yeah, now it's working. Okay, all right. So you can see his background is relevant and we can come back to it um, if you have questions about a particular points. Um, his itinerary, it's important, as you know, that he was excommunicated from the Jewish community um, because of his abominable heresies and monstrous acts. He ends up living with various radical Christian sects in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a really complex place at that time, and Spinoza's positioning with uh, who he's meeting and talking with are very important. Philosophically, he's very influenced by the general philosophical environment, which is particularly um, in which Descartes, the French philosopher, is very important. And Spinoza's only published two books in his lifetime. One was uh, The Principles of Cartesian Philosophy, which he wrote as a kind of summary and commentary on Descartes. And the second one was The Theological Political Treatise. Um, he only published one book under his own name. That was the book on Descartes. The book on um, The Theological Political Treatise was published anonymously um, because he was afraid of what the consequences might be if he was um, directly identified as the author of that book, All right? So here we get a quick sense of the different texts that he wrote. Um, as you can see, the early text, the Trees and the Emendation of the Intellect, the short treatise, which actually wasn't discovered until the 19th century. Um, again, it was lost and then discovered in the 19th century. Um, uh, but the Principles of Cartesian Philosophy was a relatively early text that was published. The Theological Political Treatise was published in 1670 after he worked on it. And I'll talk a little bit about when he began work on that in a second. Um, but his main work, which was the ethics, which you've been reading selections of, was only published at, at his death, after his death, in what were called the posthumous works. Um, we know that Spinoza looked at the posthumous works before they were published. So what was published as his works uh, were actually reviewed by him before he died. And so we have a strong sense that it does represent um, what he wanted to be uh, out there. Okay, the text I'm gonna focus on is the Theological Political Treatise. And this is the uh, original title page. Um, and you can see it, well, it's in Latin, which is also important. We can talk about maybe language issues later if you're interested why it was published in Latin. Uh, it was uh, someone proposed to translate into Dutch um, and Spinoza, we have a letter from him that said that he didn't want it translated into Dutch and he begged the person not to translate into Dutch. And I can talk also about why that was the case. Um, as you can see from the title page, there's no author on the title page, right? So Spinoza's not there. Um, uh, although later people be identified it with it, him with it pretty quickly. Um, and it was also it had a false place of publication. That was another trick that people used to try to disassociate the text with any um, particular group of people. Um, it was alleged to be have been published in Hamburg, uh, but in fact, it was printed in Amsterdam uh, near where Spinoza was living. Um, the book was banned. It was seized multiple times from the bookshelves and burned and also banned and destroyed but it was reprinted multiple times, which shows you that even despite these official bans, um, there was still great interest in it and it was commented upon um, by a variety of people. Um, it drew really outraged reactions. So even when it was published, people were upset. Um, a Dutch philosopher wrote, uh, quote, it's a work which abolishes and absolutely subverts all worship and religion and clandestinely introduces atheism. Right? And that was supposed to be really a bad thing. It was damning. Um, like some people now, people thought that if you were an atheist, uh, you couldn't be moral and you, couldn't, you wouldn't have any incentive to follow the law. And we can talk about that. It comes up again in the text later. Um, and so atheism was a very damning um, judgment to make of someone or a text. 
uh, in that period. It means a variety of different things, but that's kind of what it in, fact, in effect means. So the idea that this was propagating atheism was making it a dangerous text. Um, and another important political philosopher who also influenced Spinoza, and we can talk about this later if you're interested, I'm not going to talk a lot about influences, but just mention some people that might have did influence him. Hobbes, who was an English philosopher, perhaps one of the most important English philosophers of this period, um, he had read the text and he was alleged to have said, I durst not write so boldly. In other words, Hobbes was also thought of as an atheist. Hobbes was also attacked um, over and over by his compatriots in England and then also on the continent. But he was also read really widely. And we know that his text, Leviathan, was translated into Latin um, uh, not long. It was originally published in English, then translated into Latin. And Spinoza certainly read it um, in Amsterdam before, as around, it appeared around the time that he was working on this particular book. Um, so Hobbes' reaction to this was like, well, wow, this is pretty radical what you're saying. I maybe think some of the same things, but I wouldn't have said it so openly, right? And that gives you an idea a little bit about how um, this work was perceived. Why did Spinoza write this text? Well, we know because he told us. So it's always nice to say, why did you do it? We don't have to speculate it. Um, one of his uh, correspondents, Henry Oldenburg, who was a German living in London, who was later became secretary of the Royal Society, which was the kind of became this preeminent scientific institution in the 17th century and then in the 18th century as well later. Um, Oldenburg was the secretary. So his job was to kind of connect to all these interesting thinkers and the connection, the distinction between science and philosophy in this period was, was not so clear as it is today. Scientists and philosophers are often one and the same. Descartes was an example of this, a very important scientist, Leibniz, other people. Um, the distinction begins to develop in this period. Anyway, so Oldenburg is responsible for making connections to interesting, what he could, people called natural philosophers in this period. Spinoza is one of them. He took an acute interest in Spinoza's work and he's writing him a bunch of letters and we have them. So in letter Oldenburg, in letter 30, Spinoza is responding to Oldenburg's letter, which says, well, Baruch, you know, what are you working on right now? And so Spinoza tells him, that he's writing on a book on scripture. Um, and Oldenburg then writes back and says, well, why are you, you know, I hear that you're working on this thing on scripture, why are you doing it? And then Spinoza gives us three reasons why he's working on it. And the first he says is, and this is, these are quotes from the letter, the prejudices of the theologians, right? So he's very concerned that he thinks that philosophy is being impeded by theology. In other words, what religious writers are saying and thinking, also what they're doing in public, and we can talk about that as well, because there's a political dimension of it. It's impeding the possibility of, of rational discourse. Therefore, I'm going to try to undermine some of those prejudices and give a critique of them. So that's one reason. Um, the second reason he says is, I'm going to write it because the I'm trying to refute the opinion of me held by the common people. And the term here is the vault. Another translation often in English is the vulgar, which gives you an idea of the common, being a common person wasn't always a good thing in the 17th century. Uh, it was often a, a very negative thing. Um, so he's uh, trying to avert the opinion that people hold of him that they, he's being accused of as an atheist as being an atheist. Now, we saw this already, Van Veltuysen, right, who's not really a vulgar person, although maybe he's not a common person, he's a very educated elite figure, but Spinoza is kind of lumping him a little bit in with the, with the commoners uh, because he was um, alleging that Spinoza was an atheist. And so you can see this was a common view that people held. And Spinoza says, I'm driven to avert this accusation. So one of the interesting things is later, of course, within the Jewish tradition too, um, many, later Jewish readers uh, see, think of Spinoza as a kind of atheist, as undermining religion. So within the Jewish reception of Spinoza, you see many of these same themes that say Christian and other thinkers were um, expressing in the 17th century when the text was first published, which is Spinoza is undermining religion in general, he's undermining Judaism in particular, um, and he's an atheist. He's telling us to worship, uh, if anything, nature and not God, uh, and therefore, 
um, uh, he's dangerous to, to religion. So Spinoza says, I'm going to show you that I'm not an atheist. That's interesting. I'm not an atheist. And third, and this is crucial to the political dimension of the text, he's going to show that he's going to defend the freedom of philosophizing. Right? So he thinks that you know, we take for granted living in liberal states like Canada, that um, people have a right to express their views within reason. I mean, there are limits, of course, to free expression. Uh, we're often seeing the, the limits of that, you know, like can Trump speak, say whatever he wants on Twitter or on Facebook. And today, you know, we saw there was a, yet again another discussion about the extent of free speech in the United States, at least. And there are similar discussions, of course, in Canada. Um, and so, but we take it for granted that at least this is uh, something that we should cherish and that we should defend and, and try to, you know, to exercise. But in the 17th century, it wasn't a given. Okay, so Spinoza, we have to look at it in context, this was a more radical position then than it is now. Um, namely, that he thinks that freedom of speech is crucial and that the state can grant the freedom of, of speech. Um, and the real worry, both to freedom of speech, but also, as we'll see later, the stability of the state is what he calls the preachers, right? So popular religion for Spinoza is a real danger. So notice that in the second and third um, motives here, there's a little bit of a tension. He's attacking religion um, and saying here that the preachers are part of the problem. But the flip side is he also wants to claim he's not an atheist, right? So he wants to defend religion in some way as well. And that's going to be important to thinking about what the structure of this text is. Okay, so that's kind of the, the, the goals of it. Um, and the other thing, a couple of things now that we can use, look in the background before we actually look at some of the main themes of the text itself, or there are kind of two, some big ideas that we need to look at. And these big ideas you've already seen. So um, because uh, you've been reading the ethics um, and the ethics kind of gives what Spinoza's philosophical system is. And you can kind of decode parts of the theological political treatise to find elements of that metaphysical system. But of course, it's much easier if you just look at the text itself. Now you've got to remember that people when they were reading the theological political treatise, they didn't have the ethics at hand. Right, so it was published and, and a few people, his friends might have seen early drafts of the ethics, but it wasn't complete. And it was just kind of being developed at that time. And the average reader would have to literally read between the lines to see what did Spinoza really think about God, for example, and we'll come back to this in a second. But they didn't have what you have, which is the text of the ethics, which says, here's the metaphysical system that's in the background right behind it. So Spinoza's kind of developing it, thinking about it. But the big idea here, the two ideas of God that I want to contrast is, and I think that we'll see there's a certain ambiguity um, in the theological political treatise that is absent from the ethics. Um, but the two ideas are this, the transcendent idea of God, in which God is like a king who decrees laws and then rules his subject, okay? And then there's this contrasting and more radical new idea of God, how new it is, but Spinoza is kind of claiming that it's relatively new, um, is what he calls the imminent idea of God, that God is not outside of the natural order. He is imminent. He is identical in some sense. What sense is, is debatable and philosophers argue over what, what, how to understand that identity. But the basic idea is that God is identical with the laws of nature in some sense. He's not external to it. And as we'll see, he's not choosing which world to create. And then he's not intervening in it as a kind of king might or puppeteer or something that's external to that world. And then kind of putting his hands in and moving things around and changing things. Rather, if you're identical with that thing, that's just what the world is. It's God in some sense. So this is a kind of much more a different idea of God. And on the face of it, it seems, as we'll see, um, in tension with at least some of the biblical ideas of God. Um, that Spinoza is going to identify with. So as we'll see that there's a kind of blurriness about which of these two ideas of God is actually um, present in the theological political treatise. Arguably, it's the imminent conception already that's there. And some of the readers saw that. But Spinoza is, I think, purposely ambiguous. So unlike the ethics where he's trying to be very clear, at least trying to be clear, you might not have always thought that he's so clear, but he's trying to be. Here, he's being a little bit more careful and he's kind of um, maybe hiding to some degree, maybe that his views about say the nature of God, that's just useful to keep in mind. 
Okay, so here's the God of the ethics. This is a kind of full statement um, in the appendix to part one. Uh, you know, I, I can read it quickly, but it's just, it will be there in your handout if you want to look at it. Um, and this is the kind of radical imminent conception of God that ultimately Spinoza philosophically speaking is going to defend, okay? And what we're going to find is elements of this in the theological political treatise, but it's never going to be this clearly stated. Um, he says he's demonstrated that God's nature is that he exists necessarily, he's unique, that he acts from necessity of his nature alone, that he's free, right? In this radical and, and new sense, we can come back to if you're interested and talk about that, that all things are in God and depend on him, right? And so God is identical with the world and all things are in God, literally, um, and that all things have been predetermined by God, right? So there's a kind of highly ordered, determined, structure to the universe um, that is subject to um, laws of nature, which determine um, a kind of natural outcome or necessity to the events in the world. So that's Spinoza's big philosophical idea um, that we have there. That's the God of the ethics. All right. Now, the other thing that we need from the, from the, from the philosophical system more broadly to understand when we look at the theological political treatise um, is the distinction uh, about how we know the world. And in fancy philosophical discourse, this is called epistemology. That's the study of how we know the world, okay? And Spinoza has a very elaborate theory about how we know the world. Um, and it's based on a basic, a pretty fundamental distinction between what he calls reason and the imagination, okay? And the other thing you have to remember is that when Spinoza uses the word imagination, we, living in the 21st century in the wake of romanticism and all kinds of other um, later philosophical ideas, we tend to think that the imagination is a good thing, right? We tend to think that it's wonderful to develop your imaginative capacity if we want our children to be imaginative and to think about things um, uh, through using their imagination. Um, but in the 17th century, the imagination was problem problematic. Um, and that in the 17th century, there's a hierarchy in the way in which we know the world, meaning some ways of knowing the world are better. And the way that's the best is when you use reason to know the world. And when you use the imagination, we can't help but use the imagination to understand the world, but it's inferior to reason, right? So if we put reason on top, the imagination is second. And as with other philosophers in this period, Spinoza is going to argue the, the root of many of our problems right, in religion and politics and elsewhere is ultimately due to the imagination, right? Is that we have ideas that are not very well founded. They're not particularly rational um, and that they are the cause of our, um, our suffering and problems often, the imaginative ideas. So there's this very strong sense that we have to use reason to change or reform the imagination, to control it, to correct it, to try to um, to improve it, right, to arrive at rational ideas. So Spinoza calls these rational ideas adequate ideas. It gives you a sense, uh, you know, kind of the normative sense of what he's meaning. These are adequate, these are better. They're universal and they're based on common notions, meaning all people have these rational ideas. So sometimes people think that, well, if you're a rationalist in the way Spinoza is, that's a kind of form of elitism because Right, only a few people really are highly educated and can do philosophy and science, etc. But it's Spinoza, like many other later Enlightenment philosophers, certainly believed that everyone was capable of reason. Right now, some people don't develop their reasons for various reasons. Sometimes they're prevented from developing their reason. Um, but Spinoza thinks that it's common to our human nature as such that we can be rational. So he thinks it's everyone has this. So that's very crucial. And it becomes important later that this is the case. Um, inadequate ideas or what he calls the, or how he describes the imagination. And those are gonna be based on sense impressions like what we know from our particular circumstances as human beings and our sense apparatus and how we know the world, okay? They're partly true because, you know, what our senses tell us are not by themselves, it's not always false. But what happens often is that we use our senses to develop theories which can be, um, uh, turn out to be false. Um, and that's what the real danger is. So senses in themselves are not necessarily problematic as long as we recognize that they only are giving us a partial understanding of the way the world is. Um, the imagination, 
is useful, but it's limited and, and, and has a particular use. The reason has to come in and correct it in various ways, okay? Does that make sense to everyone? I hope, yeah. I mean, so it's a kind of, it's important to keep these in mind. You've already get a sense of this. Let's move on. Okay, now Spinoza uses this distinction at the beginning of the theological political treatise, right? So I wanna kind of get in and this is crucial. These are the first couple um, paragraphs and I'm gonna have them in full here for you to look at of the theological political treatise because in a way, it, to my mind, it's a pretty radical and revolutionary um, uh, perspective on religion, right? Um, Spinoza seems to suggest here that religion, as we commonly think of it, develops from our weakness, the fact that we are finite individuals in a world that we don't completely control, okay? Um, and there's a kind of existential desperation right, in our lives, as given that we're finite creatures that can't completely control our circumstances, um, and that leads us to kind of fantasize about the way the world is, because we realize that if we could understand the way the world is, we could maybe have some control over our circumstances. But since most of us are not particularly rational, um, people tend to make uh, imaginative explanations of the world, which are not always true, in order to account for the way the world is, right? So let me read you these three paragraphs and you can begin to get a sense of what, how Spinoza comes to this conclusion. If men were able to exercise complete control over all their circumstances, they would ever, they would um, never be prey to superstition, I should say here. But since they are often reduced to such straits as to be without any resource, and their moderate greed for fortune's fickle favors often makes them the wretched victims of alternated hope and fear, the result is, for the most part, their credulity knows no bounds, right? So the example I always come up with here is you imagine you're a farmer and you're, you depend on rain uh, and the right, um, say, weather for your crops to grow. Uh, and you just don't know whether the weather is going to be conducive or not to your um, project of farming. So, you're, you, so you have the, the food, you put the seeds into the ground, you're hoping that your crops will grow, you're hoping there'll be just the right amount of water, of rain, of sun, um, so that your crops will develop. And you realize that if they don't, right, you could be in deep trouble, right? You could starve to death, your family might not have enough to eat, etc. So you have to kind of imagine this very simple situation. And that means that we want to know more than anything, what's going to control the circumstances. And we're ready to believe because we alternate so wildly between hoping that things will turn out in our favor, but also fearing that they may not. We're prone to belief. We're prone to believe things that people come forward and say, oh, this is what you need to do. This would explain when, if you need rain, you need to do this. Um, you need to you know, pray to the gods for rain, for example. And then if they listen to your um, uh, petitions, then maybe they'll, the, the, it will rain and you'll get what you want. And so people, because they're so desperately worried about um, their circumstances and they have so little control, they're willing to listen to any of these even wildly implausible explanations of what's going on because something, some explanation is better than nothing, right? So that's the kind of situation that we're in, right? And so here, as he develops this thought, right? He says, well, you know, we like to believe that, right? We're willing to believe things and therefore we'll be swayed by whomever comes along and gives some explanation that appeals to our particular circumstances, right? Um, and we believe, for instance, that God, there's such a thing as God, and here we know is talking about God as the imagination depicts God. God controls like whether it will rain or whether um, it will have the right amount of sun that will help our uh, crops grow. And so this is the way in which our, the uh, kind of calm, superstitious ideas of religion develop. They're not based on reason, on a systematic investigation of the natural order. It's based rather on um, these kinds of uh, imaginative ideas that people have offered us that help us understand what's going on in the world to alleviate our uh, this wretched vacillation between hopes uh, and fears, right? And then once you've bought into these irrational um, stories, these imaginative stories about what's controlling the world around you, then it turns against reason, 
right? So reason they call blind because it cannot reveal a sure way to the vanities that they covet and human wisdom they call vain while the delusions of the imagination, dreams and other childish absurdities are taken to be the oracles of God, right? So what you have here is this account of how superstition develops, why people are prone to it, how they then become the victims of it in a certain sense, and then how crucially it's used against the rational explanations of the, of the order of the world, right? Um, people would rather have the imaginative, the comfort in the imaginative accounts than they would in these rational explanations or the very limited rational explanations that we can have. Uh, and therefore people uh, become prey to these superstitions, right? And we're living in a time where there's been an increased, obviously the world is facing a massive crisis there are many stories out there about what's going on and what's happening. We don't always understand um, uh, what's, what we face uh, and people are prone to believe all kinds of superstitious stories about what's happening rather than say what science teaches us, which in science itself of course is limited and can't always give us a satisfying explanation. Um, and people will turn to a more complete explanation which they think that something um, in the imagination can give them, right? So for Spinoza, this is a kind of, what we might think of as a psychological, a sociological, an anthropological account of how religion develops. It's not based on, you know, revelation from God and, you know, taking it on the face value that these things are happening. Rather, Spinoza thinks that he can give us what we would think of now as a kind of modern human focused or explanation of how religion develops uh, in the context of our predicament. Right now, this, I'm not gonna go through all the quotes that I have here, but I just wanna show you, you can look at the handout and see what some of these things is. But then after he's given us this preface, which is the beginning of the theological political treatise, then Spinoza begins the task of trying to explain, right, what we think of as religion in these terms, right? And both to kind of show, um, therefore, what its weaknesses are, but if there is any redeeming purpose to it, maybe it does still have some value or purpose. Like what can it actually do for us in some ways? So prophecy, prophecy is crucial because this is the way in which God's will is revealed to the ancient Israelites. This is how we know the word of God. So what is prophecy? And it claims to be a true knowledge of the nature of, of God and what God is, how he's organizing the world on our behalf, etc. cetera. Um, and Spinoza says, gives us a very kind of, in light of what we've just seen, he gives us a pretty deflationary conception of, of prophecy, right? Prophecy has some value, he's gonna say, but not the value that we tend to think that it has, right? Prophecy um, can have two senses. There can be prophecy in the sense of like true knowledge of the natural order, but then that turns out to be what reason tells us. So that's not really prophecy, rather, Right, as he says in the last um, sentence of this quote, prophetic knowledge is usually taken to exclude natural knowledge. So it's everything that reason doesn't tell us about the world, that's what we're gonna lump under prophecy, okay? So prophecy is already being more limited, it's not necessarily rational. Um, and this is something that's very crucial in, the, in terms of the Jewish tradition, which claimed following Maimonides, for instance, that the prophets, and you've studied Maimonides a little bit, that the prophets were philosophers. Right? The prophets had reason and they were interpreting God through their reason and then using the imagination to communicate that to the rest of the Israelites. Spinoza takes um, issue with that. And he says here that the prophets are not philosophers. They're not using reason, right? Rather, as we'll see here now, um, God's revelations were received only with the aid of the imaginative faculty. So the prophets fit into this model, according to Spinoza, of how religion develops, which is um, it develops through the imagination and not through reason, right? So Spinoza is beginning to kind of try to split apart, given what the agenda is here, reason and the imagination, and trying to show us that religion is primarily, as we ordinarily understand it, the religion that in scriptures, um, the old, what Spinoza called the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Jewish and Christian scriptures, um, Spinoza is saying that this is primarily um, a religion, a set of texts that are based on the imagination and not on reason, right? So in some sense, they fit this kind of negative model that he's elaborated from the beginning, right? And so 
the nature. So that means that when we look at these books of scripture, we have to be very careful. We're not going to find scientific knowledge in scripture because Spinoza thinks that they're a product of the imagination and reason is what leads to what we think of as science. Rather, scripture, if it has any purpose, right, it can obviously fit into this narrative he's already given us of how it can lead to just um, specious and credulous explanations of things. Uh, but he also, maybe if it does have any purpose, it, it, that it has any value, then it's gonna have to be understood in the light of something a little bit different. It's not gonna be equivalent to science. So we can't ennoble religion by claiming that it contains the truths of science, right? That's gonna be crucial to what he's gonna tell us here. Right, now, what's important here, and the reason why I put this little quote up is because Spinoza doesn't give up. Some people think, well, what Spinoza is doing here is just debunking religion. He's just showing that it's, um, it's based on the imagination. The imagination leads us into error. And as a consequence, um, uh, it must be just part, part of the superstitious uh, set of beliefs that Spinoza wants to undermine or eliminate in favor of reason. Okay. Now, there is an element of that kind of critique in this text. But there's also a kind of another sense, which I've hinted at, in which Spinoza is trying to, as it were, show that religion still, even with all its limitations, might have some value. Does that make sense? I think that's kind of crucial. It might have some value. And how do we know this? We can distinguish between two kinds of prophecy. If the prophets are these imaginative figures, figures with vivid imaginations, interpreting the world in God in light of their imaginations, not through reason, as Maimonides claimed, but primarily through their imagination. Doesn't that lead them all into error? Spinoza says, not necessarily. Some prophets are false prophets, meaning they're just there to manipulate us. And other prophets are true prophets, right? And how do you know whether someone is a true prophet or a false prophet, right? Well, he tells us here, he gives us three signs that we can use to interpret true prophecy, right? So he says here, first, that they are vividly imagined. So it can't just be any story. It has to be something very vivid and very striking. So there's a kind of uh, visceral quality to prophecy, which is important. So it has maybe what we think of now as a literary quality, something that kind of elevates the speaker above ordinary um, figures that use the imagination. Second, there has to be a sign, right? And signs often mean, for Spinoza, something, well, they, he says they could be miracles, but the prophets were often accompanied by external signs. So there's some uh, feature in the natural world which corresponds to prophecy. And this is kind of important in a certain ways. This, this is a complicated one. I'm gonna kind of skip over most of what Spinoza says about it. But the third part of it, which is crucial and easy, easier to make sense of for our purposes, is that he says that we can see that the, these true prophets were devoted towards what's right and what's good, right? So Spinoza is saying that the prophets that are true, right, how do we know them? We, they can't tell us that science is going to verify the prophecy because it's not rational, right? What they can do is they can tell us, uh, we can see whether the prophecy uh, is true or not, whether it leads us to things that we think are good, okay? Um, now, of course, that itself is complicated to figure out. How do we know what's good? And isn't prophecy supposed to tell us what's good, right? We can't always say. Um, but that's crucial, that there's a moral criterion and that the audience has to kind of be able to use that. So if someone is, so if a prophet is telling you to go sin or to do something that you consider to be a sin, to lie, to cheat, to steal, right? And you have this, a sense that that would be wrong, then that's at least one reason why you might doubt whether the prophet is a true prophet and question whether it's leading you in the right direction or not. So in other words, we are engaged in this complicated interpretive process when it comes to religion to try to figure out what constitutes true prophecy and what isn't. And this, I take it, is what's actually very interesting about the text, um, is that Spinoza is not just simply trying to get rid of religion altogether, whether it's Christianity or Judaism, Rather, he's telling us that there's something built into religion, right? the religions that, that we have, Judaism, let's say, um, that allows us to kind of direct our lives in ways that can be useful or salutary in a broader sense, okay? So there's something redeeming in religion. So even though as he's really 
strongly critiquing religion, right? explaining its psychological origins, explaining some of the limitations of its knowledge claims. The flip side, I think, which is important is these also showing step-by-step step how we might be able to use religion in particular ways um, for our purposes, okay? How am I doing with time here? Are we, we we're doing okay? Yeah, I mean, we can go till nine o'clock if we want to, or we can end sooner. And there are a few questions in the chat, so you're- Okay, you're, let me just go on just a little bit. Do people, oh, so I, I can't see the chats right now because I'm sharing my screen. Uh, do people want to ask questions now? Do you want to, are there are questions that have come up already? I'm happy to maybe stop for a second and talk a little bit about what we've done so far. Sure. Um, I, let me just um, ask a couple of the questions that were here. Phil asked, he said, I understand his abominable heresies, but what were the monstrous acts? So what was being described when with that language? Yeah, right. Well, I think it's just... I think that what it is is Spinoza's engaged in, in this and we're seeing it here. So now, now that we've looked at already the first few sections of the theological political treatise, it's I think we don't know for sure because we don't have a lot more evidence. We don't know what exactly was being pointed out as these monstrous acts. I think the most likely explanation is it's the questioning of religious authority that's what's actually monstrous here is that Spinoza is saying, look, we have to go against the, the religious authorities would have had, let's say, a Maimonidean approach to understanding scripture, right? So if you're in learning the scripture, learning how to interpret scripture, you're being told it expresses reason, expresses science, expresses God in this particular way through reason. And Spinoza is saying, hang on a second, we don't really have evidence that that's true. I'm going to give you an alternate explanation that points to a really different understanding of what these religious texts are saying and doing, and also what their limitations are, right, as texts. And that challenge to authority, I think, is really what people see as being monstrous. Yeah. So th this was a question I put in the chat before I remember that I was the one moderating the questions. Okay. Uh, I asked, where does he learn, you, you mentioned freedom of speech, which to us is such, you know, just something that we, we all know is important, but where does he learn ideas like freedom of speech or the idea like that a, that a government should belong to the people? These seem like modern ideas. Is that from Descartes? Well, Who, who's coming up with these ideas? Well, a couple of things. I mean, I, I think that we'll talk a little bit, the, uh, hopefully we'll get to it, but the last part of the presentation talks a little bit about his political ideas, right? Um, I think that Spinoza is a central figure in the foundation of modern liberalism. So Spinoza is actually one of the first figures that actually advocates for freedom of speech as a principle in modern society. So Hobbes, who was also an important thinker in this period, um, is not actually a very strong advocate of, uh, he believes in a social contract and Spinoza gets the idea of a social contract, we'll come to that, um, his kind of principle of, of how to form a political society and what the structure of it should be, which is a very modern liberal idea. Spinoza doesn't come up with that. Hobbes does, and there are other figures as well. Um, but Hobbes, for example, doesn't believe in freedom of speech. He thinks that you give the sovereign complete power. And one of the things that come, goes along with that power is the suppression of, of free speech. In fact, that's a good thing right, for a stable government. And what Spinoza is showing here in this treatise, and we'll get to it at the end, is that in fact, freedom of speech is essential to um, this form of government, that people will only abide by the, the social contract that they've agreed to to form a government if they feel they have the right to question that government at the same time. So there's a kind of interesting paradox, which is central to modern liberalism, I think, that Spinoza is actually one of the very first people to articulate. So I would say that Spinoza is actually one of the first figures um, developing the importance of free speech. Yeah. Thank you. One more question that Carla put into the, into the chat was asking you to clarify what is a converso versus a Murano? And if, if Spinoza was a converso, were they fully Jews or were they also Christians by this time? Maybe you can just clarify what his background was versus- well, Conversos and Muranos are the same thing basically, except Murano is like a dirty word for it comes, it's kind of like a pig means or something. And so it was a kind of negative slur that was used against conversos. So um, conversos are, uh, Muranos and conversos are Jews that were um, forced to convert to Christianity during the inquisition. 
Um, and Spinoza's family com comes from these people that lived um, as what were called crypto Jews or um, secret Jews that were on the surface Christians. They converted to Christianity, but they still maintained some degree of Judaism. Um, but these people, Spinoza's family, were among the many Jews that in the end eventually left. So those people were put into question. They were persecuted, even if they were had converted to Christianity. Um, and so many Jews uh, who had converted to Christianity decided that this wasn't going to work out and they had to leave and they were either because they wanted to live openly as Jews again or because they just actually weren't tolerated as the so-called new Christians. And then they left and they went to Portugal, then they went to France and Spinoza's family eventually went to Holland and Holland is where and then Jews were able to live openly as Jews again. So they were families that had been conversos, meaning they'd converted at some point to Christianity during the Inquisition, um, but then they kind of reconvert, as it were, or relive their Judaism in, in freely again. Um, and so the community in Amsterdam uh, was kind of marked by these Jews who were very anxious to live openly and freely as Jews, but who had, on the other hand, their families had lived for generations kind of as non-Jews. And so there was a kind of very complex mix of people in this community, some of whom were, yeah, had, within in their own lives had been professed Christians not too long before. And they had to import. So Spinoza is one of the teachers that he would have had at this religious school in Amsterdam. The Jews in Amsterdam had to import teachers from elsewhere. So for example, from Venice, where there was a very old important Jewish community, and the leading um, rabbi in Amsterdam was actually from Venice. Um, and they were brought in to kind of teach them what it meant to be a good Jew, right? And to have those, relearn those traditions of interpretation and, and behavior that are central to um, Jewish life, uh, but didn't always work out so well. Maybe Spinoza is a good example of how it, it failed, yeah. Thank you. There's actually one more question that just okay. got put into the chat from Phil. Since he believed that, believed that everything is preordained, did he therefore believe that evil people should not be punished because they had no choice in the matter? Yeah, it's a super interesting question. And we'll come back to this when it comes to the law. I think Spinoza kind of has a double attitude towards it. I think he thinks that um, we have to imagine that we're free to some degree because in fact, to act as, uh, as if we're predetermined, everything was predetermined is almost impossible for a uh, finite individual to do that. And it would also have very contrary um, and unfortunate effects if it was um, understood in the wrong way, right? So for instance, so Spinoza actually has a letter about the problem of punishment. And I mean, so there's two different answers. So let me, let me this is actually a very complicated question. This is a really good question. Um, one answer is we can't actually always act as if we're um, determined. And so we use the imagination and we imagine ourselves to be free, even if we know from the point of view of science that that's not completely true. And he thinks that systems of law, for example, within states presuppose some degree of freedom. Um, and even if that's not true, we have to kind of follow within that imaginary construct of freedom. That's kind of, a, I think, an interesting answer, but that's part of it. And then he has another answer for the philosopher. And, in, and that's in a letter. And someone raises this question just as you did uh, to him directly. And he says, I just don't think it's a problem because in this, in this way, he's actually very much like Maimonides because he thinks that the reward and punishment is immediately found in the result of the action. So if you are a bad person, you will be punished because the quality of your life will be diminished in some way. You're farther from God or the, act, the quality of your actions will be worse. And if you're good, then the quality of your actions that result from your character will be better. And so there's an immediate reward and punishment, right, that results from, um, from one's actions. So from, from a philosophical point of view, he thinks that, um, right, that, that punishment still can be understood in light of a determined system. Now, not everyone agrees with this, by the way. This is, many people will say this is an incoherent answer. Um, but there's a long tradition within philosophy, and Spinoza is not the only one, that thinks that there is a way to make sense of some of these notions, at least, of punishment and reward, even in a determined system. And that's what he'd have to take up as a challenge to answer your question. Those are all the questions you've got. Okay, well, this, so this, uh, if you're 
if you're fine with this, and I hope you find this interesting a little bit, that we're, we can go on and we can talk a little bit more about what he goes on after this. Um, and you can begin to see how the system develops in the theological political treatise. So here, right, in this long passage, I'm not gonna kind of go over every aspect of it. He does give us this, uh, an answer in the chapter three of the theological political treatise, an answer to the question of what God's relationship to the world is. Um, and he makes all kinds of claims that are kind of pretty radical and interesting. And you begin to see how he's translating theological conceptions, religious conceptions about God's relation to the world into his philosophical vocabulary, okay? So just take the first sentence, for instance. By God's direction, I mean the fixed and immutable order of nature, right? So God directs the world, right? Which would be a, a typical Jewish view of God's providence. God is organizing the world towards a particular end. Um, but what does that mean for Spinoza? Well, what that means is not that God is kind of intervening in the world like a puppeteer and organizing things. Rather, God is organizing, directing the world through the natural laws, which are fixed and immutable and can't change, right? So if you want to know how God is organizing and structuring the world, then what you have to do is uh, look at the nature of uh, natural law, right? So he's already changing things in a particular way. So this gives us a sense of how Spinoza is trying to kind of um, eliminate or not maybe eliminate, but change the meaning of some of these religious conceptions in light of his rational philosophical system. Right? Now, one of the things that also follows from his view, right, which was also controversial and led him to lots of problems with um, the Jewish community and also might be partly what, uh, you know, the, the question was, what were Spinoza's monstrous acts? And, you know, well, he was challenging the sense in which the Jews are chosen, right, for instance, or he's changing the meaning of the election of the Jews. So the election of the Jews is the sense in which God chose the Jewish people, here are the Hebrews, particular end. Um, and Sometimes, certainly in the philosophical tradition, following Maimonides, you guys read Maimonides, right? There's a sense in which, for Maimonides, the Jews are chosen in the sense that they have true philosophy built into their scripture. So if you really want, if you're a philosopher and you really want to understand the nature of scripture, you can see that God's word, the, the Hebrew Bible, is a, a philosophical text at core. It's hidden but the philosopher can see that the true meaning of scripture according to Maimonides is philosophical. And Spinoza denies that. So Maimonides view is that, well, yes, the Jews are chosen. How are they chosen? Well, they're chosen because of course they have God's greatest wisdom, which is uh, philosophy, which is contained in scripture itself. And Spinoza says, that's just not true, okay? He says, you look at the bottom of this paragraph, the Hebrews were chosen by God above all, not for the true life or higher understanding, not because Jews are kind of superior thinkers than other people. I know like we like to believe that with all those Nobel prizes and everything else, we're really special. Um, but Spinoza thinks that, you know, he's looking around him and he doesn't think the Jews are particularly philosophically impressive. He thinks that Maimonides although he's a great thinker, made lots of basic philosophical errors in understanding things. Um, so he thinks that Jewish philosophy is not particularly distinguished at his point in time. Uh, and so he thinks that if we're going to look back and look at the ancient Israelites, they didn't have, there's no evidence, he thinks, at all in scripture that there's scientific understanding in the Bible, right? In fact, if you take the Bible to be a guide to science, you're just going to be, uh, you know, compounding your ignorance. Rather, he thinks that there's a different reason, right? Why, right? Well, what's that reason, right? In which the Jews might have been chosen? They were chosen by God, right? Not because of their philosophy, but because of their social organization and the way in which they organized their practical life for many years. And this is what you see in scripture itself. I mean, scripture, according to Spinoza, if you just read it quite literally, tells us something very important about the ancient Israelites and about Jewish life in general. The Jews had good laws, and when they followed those laws, they did well. And when they disobeyed the laws, they did badly, and they were punished and defeated and conquered and suffered, right? And so he thinks that the, the story of the Jewish uh, scripture tells us 
the very ways in which Jews were chosen, which was the Jews came up with a good way of life, right? Um, that uh, maybe has some philosophical implications or maybe is, has some uh, uh, larger wisdom contained within it. But basically it's not a philosophical system, it's a good way of life. And when the Jews followed those laws that, that they, God gave them, we'll talk about this in, maybe in, in a question, but God gave these laws to the Jews in a sense, the Jews created the laws, I think, through God, through understanding of God, then they do well. And when they don't, they're not. So Spinoza also thinks, right, it falls from this, that when the Hebrew state was destroyed, right, when the Jews uh, lost their power to maintain a coherent social organization, um, that in fact, they are no longer chosen. Right. And so this is also was very, this is, you can see again, why he was excommunicated from the Jewish community, because he's telling the rabbis that we are not chosen anymore. We were, there was a period in which we followed the laws, in which were organized as a state, as a, as, a, as a coherent social group that succeeded in these various ways. But then we lost our way. We became bad philosophers. We became powerless. Uh, and we became um, deluded about the sense in which we were chosen. Uh, and in fact, we're not chosen anymore. That's kind of Spinoza's view. He says, look around us, we're living um, uh, in a way that we don't have power, we don't have control over our own circumstances in the same way that we used to, at least in the Bible. We can't be said to be chosen in the way that we were chosen in the Bible. And that would have upset people, obviously, because at this point, after thousands of years being in the diaspora, Jews had developed a very elaborate sense, spiritual sense of chosenness that was disconnected from political power, okay? And so for Spinoza to link um, chosenness to a certain social and political organization, that would have been saying like, well, yeah, thousands of years ago we were chosen, but now that we have no control over our own circumstances as a people, we're not chosen anymore. But this is exactly why people like Ben-Gurion in the Zionist imagination, they love Spinoza because Spinoza does say in this passage connected, not in the passage I've quoted you, but right connected to this, he says, well, if we were miraculously to organize ourselves again and to create a state again, we might be able to say that we've been chosen, right? And so Ben-Gurion, he tried to, um, you know, in 1953, he proposed to the Knesset in Israel that Spinoza be given honorary citizenship of Israel because he was the first Zionist, you know, in his mind, who was saying, look, it's possible that we could gain our pride back as a people and we would deserve the right to be chosen again. And we've done it. You know, here we are sitting in Jerusalem uh, and we, we can do that because we've actually reorganized ourselves politically uh, and we deserve the epithet chosen again, so Ben-Gurion would say. So he, he, th he thought very highly of Spinoza. Okay, so you begin to kind of see like how that view is really pretty interesting. Now there's a whole lot of things I'm gonna skip over because we're gonna run out of time. I have a lot to say about laws. Spinoza has a lot to say about laws. Um, but one of the crucial thing, I'll jump to the, 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 this point, um, which is also a kind of radical um, thing, is that Spinoza contrasts divine law, what he calls the laws of reason from ceremonial law, which he thinks have been produced by the imagination. And so if you wanna look at what Spinoza's relation to reform Judaism is, and I know that's been one, maybe a theme that might interest some of you, you can begin to see in his critique of law, right, how Spinoza becomes the inspiration for reform Jews. Why? Because he thinks that there's a kind of common moral core that all human beings have. And that doesn't require any particular revelation and Jews don't have any more special relation to that eternal law any more than any other person in the world does. All human beings are reasonable. All human beings can see what the right way to live is through reason. Um, and so that sense we're completely equal. The things that are different about Jews, the ceremonial laws, the ritual laws, Spinoza thinks are completely contingent, right? and that they don't express in any deeper moral truth. So when reformed Jews say, for instance, well, we don't, you know, keep kosher, yeah, maybe if you want, uh, you know, that could be, 
Do you have to do this ritual or that ritual? Do we have to kind of follow the body of law as people have developed it in, in the rabbinic corpus? Um, Spinoza is going to say, well, you know, no. I mean, that's part of your particular tradition. There may be reasons why you hold it, but it's nothing universal. And in fact, you can be completely moral without that, those things, right? So ceremonial law, in Spinoza's view, um, is maybe significant for the way in which Jews live as a particular group of people among others, but it doesn't give them any pride of place, right, over other people. And he diminishes the significance of ceremonial laws in contrast to the moral laws. And that was something in the 19th century in Germany when Reform Judaism develops that many people kind of turned in that period to Spinoza as an inspiration for rethinking the way in which religious law functions in our individual lives, for example. Right, so this idea that in Reform Judaism, what's the reform that's going on within Reform Judaism? Well, many things are being reformed, but one of the key ideas is the reform of the meaning of the idea of law, right? And that's what Spinoza is a, a crucial source of that. Okay, so I want to kind of I'm going to jump over a bunch of other kind of interesting things that we can talk about, and I said I'd talk just for a few minutes about politics. And then I'd rather have more time for discussion than go over every single slide that I present prepared for you. So I wanna kind of engage a little bit with your thoughts and critiques here um, and see what you think. Um, but Spinoza does in the same book also give us a new vision of what social life is like. And interestingly enough, Spinoza thinks that this new vision of social life would, is the social contract, right? Something again, we take for granted, but in the 17th century was a radically new idea relatively. But Spinoza says, well, it is a new idea, but we also find a version of this already in scripture, right? So remember, Spinoza said that the Jews were special. Why were they special? Not because they had philosophical wisdom, but because they had practical wisdom, right? That is kind of, they organized their lives in a particular way. So you would expect, right, if you looked at scripture to find some evidence of this in scripture itself. And what's one of the key bits of evidence? Well, how did the Jews become a people, right? Spinoza thinks that the story of the Jews, they were slaves, they were kicked out of Egypt. So the story of Exodus, right? If you remember the story of Exodus, the Jews were kicked out of Egypt. Well, we just, you know, um, think of Passover. We just had it. And that's the story that you're telling. Jews are, are slaves. They're kicked out of Egypt. They go into the Sinai, which is a desert. And they're kind of a bunch of former slaves that have no idea how to live together because they were being directed by other people about how to live and their lives were being determined. And they're in the state in the Sinai Desert. And the Sinai Desert was what um, people in the 17th century thought of as a state of nature. That is a pre-civil order of things when people just live as isolated individuals that don't have any kind of deep social relationship. But because that leads to conflict, among people, people become motivated to produce some agreement that will allow them to live together, right? And that's called the social contract. And so people form a contract and they form a civil society which establishes a sovereign authority over them so that the laws will have um, someone to uh, they will come into existence and then have someone that will exercise them to organize social life in a particular way. And this is the story he thinks that Moses is about, right? Moses was this kind of leader that convinced the Jews who were in the state of nature where they had no coherent social order to form a society. How did he do this? By claiming to have talked to God. God com comes down with the law. The law then structures and is imposed upon the Israelites who accept it as a principle of organization. And then voila, the Jewish community is formed. The Jewish people is formed as a social group organized by laws that come from above. And Moses is the leader, but he is the mouthpiece of God. So these laws actually come from God. So it's a kind of theocracy. Um, and so in the theological political treatise, Spinoza gives us this version of the social contract. And then right afterwards explains how we find this very idea in the Hebrew Bible, which explains in part why the Jews were chosen, right? The Jews were chosen because they actually had come up with this very a clever mechanism for ordering themselves according to a system of law, which established a blueprint for how society should be founded. And in the 17th century, this was part of a very complicated change that was going on in political life. 
in which new states were being formed, right, on basis of these principles, which were being articulated independently of historical traditions of sovereigns and aristocrats. Um, the Dutch Republic, in which Spinoza um, was living, uh, kind of saw itself as a republic, as a society that was not ruled by a monarch, right? There was no history of monar uh, monarchy in, in um, the Netherlands that was indigenous. They had been a colony of the Spanish, so they'd been in servitude to the Spanish empire. They revolted in the 17th century, 16th and 17th century against the Spanish. They became an independent state in the mid 17th century around the time during Spinoza's life. Um, and then this articulates the principle that not only you know, a way to think about how Jews might live as free people again, um, but how new states like the Dutch um, Republic could be formed uh, without traditional monarchies as the ordering principle. And so what were the ordering principles? Social contracts, okay, that's the idea. Um, and so what Spinoza then uses this, and so the last few minutes here, he uses this to kind of justify, I can talk a lot about the structure here, but he uses it interestingly as a new way to talk about how religious toleration should be organized, okay? So there are kind of several different problems of religious toleration in this period. There's lots of religious conflict, right? So we see one example in the, in the role of the Jews. The Jews are a very small and weak uh, religious group uh, and they're often not tolerated. So in Spain, for example, they were forced to convert to Christianity or killed, right? Uh, or exiled, so that was a kind of very intolerant attitude. Uh, in, in the Netherlands in the 17th century, Jews are tolerated to some degree, right? They're allowed to live uh, as Jews, they're allowed to live openly, they don't have to be Christians, but they're not completely tolerated, there are still limits to the way in which they are. So the, so the problem of Jews is one form of toleration. A more pressing problem for toleration in European society was um, the conflict among Christian religious groups. So Protestants and Catholics or among even groups within the Protestantism, for example, Lutherans and, and um, Calvinists, for example, were at each other all the time. So Spinoza thinks that one of the roles of the state is to moderate religious conflict of these kinds. And how do you do it? Not by suppressing religious difference, right? But rather, as he shows at the end of this work, um, by using religion in a productive way to allow people to express their, their imaginative beliefs, which he do, doesn't think are always rational, but you can't make everyone rational simply because you want them to be. You have to accept that many people are going to be still religious and governed by these imaginative systems, but to regulate it, the state needs to create a system that regulates religion uh, in a particular way, right? And so what Spinoza tries to do at the end of this work is show how it's possible for the state not to, to exist and it will be stronger if it actually allows freedom of religion. So that's a very radical argument in the 17th century, which is that a powerful state becomes and remains powerful, not by suppressing dis religious groups and dissent, but by rather moderating, regulating and allowing for freedom of religion within the state, which is something, again, we take for granted right, that it's possible. But in the 17th century, this was a radically new idea. And so to that extent, Spinoza is kind of really, I think, a, a kind of revolutionary thinker in light of political ideas, but also in his view of how religion functions internally and its relation to others. And it makes us, it makes a claim um, on how Jews should understand their own religion. And that's why, of course, the Jews of his time couldn't handle uh, Spinoza's critique, and they just wanted to get him out, and they thought it was problematic. But later figures, right, in the, in the several hundred years after Spinoza, um, Jews have kind of tried to think and use Spinoza as a resource to think about, right, how we should organize our society in such a way that as Jews, right, we can be stronger and live in, in more liberal um, political society. Um, how is that possible? And the, the many people think that Spinoza gives us an example of how to do that, okay? All right, hopefully that leaves us some time. I'm happy to stay as long as people want, but I don't really wanna go on anymore because that's already way plenty of lecture. Um, so, but I'm happy to kind of hear your comments, discussion, responses.
So I see a couple of questions in the chat and then, I mean, if it's okay with you, we can just invite if others have questions to raise their hand and. Sure, I'd like to see you better. That's why I'm gonna eliminate sharing here. Uh, so here, let me ask me, let me ask what, what I've got here. And then if others have, uh, I can, I can call on you. I can see that your hands are raised and I think um, Professor Rosenthal can see your hands raised as well. So um, here, I, actually one more question that I had. Uh, if he, you said he published the, the theological political treatise anonymously, so how did the Jewish community know his ideas well enough to excommunicate him? Well, that's a good question. I mean, it's pretty clear. He wrote this. Uh, he started writing it through the letter that I quoted you from Oldenburg at the very beginning. That's a letter from 1666. So that's 12 years after Spinoza was excommunicated from the Jewish community. So. This book was published in 16, he was executed in 1656. Um, and then 12 years later, um, no, 10 years later, excuse me, he's writing, um, right, yes, that's right. And then 12 years later, 10 years later, excuse me, in 1666, he starts working on the theological political treatise. It's published in 1670. So we actually don't know. Some people think that, that he actually was already thinking these things 10 years earlier, elements of them. And that's probably very likely. So all we can do is extrapolate back from what he wrote 10 years after his excommunication and say, well, look what he was writing in, in the 1660s. It, no surprise the Jewish community couldn't handle this, right? Because these are outrageous ideas. And so we have to go back and that, that's all the evidence we have. So we can't really say much. We don't know what the internal disputes were in the Jewish community. But since Spinoza then later declared his views, even if he was only saying some of them 10 years earlier, that would have been enough to get him into trouble. Right, monstrous actions. Yeah. Uh, so a couple of questions here about prayer and ritual. Did, yeah. did Spinoza have personally any relationship to Jewish prayer or to ritual or Don, the way Don asked it was, did he have any thoughts about personal relationship with God through prayer? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that it's a good question. I mean, the, the way to look at it is there's kind of two different dimensions to this. And you look in any philosophical conception of prayer is going to be different. What prayer means varies, right? What the meaning of prayer is, its function varies. Maimonides, who you've studied, has an extremely intellectual conception of prayer. So he thinks that prayer ultimately um, is a, is a, a, a meta, a, has different purposes. One is a kind of, has a moral purpose, which kind of controls our, our bodies and leads us away from sin, right? So it has a practical purpose. And he thinks it has an intellectual purpose is that it focuses on us on God. Um, and so it can be a, an avenue towards spiritual union with God. Um, and both those views of prayer are kind of highly abstract from the actual rituals of prayer itself, right? So it's already a very strong interpretation. Um, so even among more canonical thinkers like Maimonides, their understanding of prayer is going to deviate quite a lot from what the ordinary conception of prayer would be. Um, and uh, so Maimonides, for instance, didn't think that God was, you know, there was really a personal, the personal conception of God uh, was just a very abstract one. And the, the personal conception of God was for people that had lesser intellects and the more abstract idea was for, for, for philosophers. Um, and there's a certain sense and that's true for Spinoza as well, meaning the imagination leads us to think of God as like another human being that we could have, you know, albeit a father figure that we have very strong, we can have a, a dialogue or a relationship with. But the more we think about it, the more unlikely that view becomes. So. The philosopher, the strength of mind that the philosopher has in both Maimonides and Spinoza is going to be expressed in the ability to actually live and incorporate in your daily life um, a very abstract conception of God, right? And to make that a living thing for you, right? So to kind of not think of God as a father figure or to have any image of God that resembles any human being or, or at all, to eliminate idols of all kind would mean to have an extremely abstract conception of God. Um, and that's the challenge that the philosopher has. And I think Spinoza has that in common, but right, go back to Spinoza in particular, Spinoza also recognizes, and this gives, goes back to the, to the role of the imagination, 
that humans inevitably, including the philosopher, think in terms of images and think in terms of our finite particular circumstances. So even if those sometimes those images and the forms of life that develop them, like ritual practices and things like that, like prayer, they can be sometimes misguided. Other times they can be very practically valuable, right? And so they can do this. Now, one of the great examples I've actually written about a little bit, which is super interesting, is in this discussion of um, uh, chosenness uh, that Spinoza has in chapter three of the theological political treatise, one of the things he talks about is circumcision, right? So, I mean, it's not prayer, but of course it's a, it's a ritual. It's a particular practice that's central to Judaism, has been certainly. Um, you know, these days some people are challenging it in various ways, but still I think most Jews practice this ritual. Um, and Spinoza kind of gives us almost like kind of sociological account of circumcision. And he says, well, you know, uh, if you believe that circumcision you know, gives you some kind of unity with God, or if you have any kind of um, you know, superstitious ideas about what it is, then you're misguided. But if you understand circumcision as part of the practices that make Jews a cohesive special people, right, in terms of kind of, a, it becomes a symbol for accepting the laws that make us um, a unique and uh, a powerful people, then it can be justified. So I think that his view about circumcision, interestingly, which is a kind of very, it's very, very much like, you know, again, another modern Jewish thinker like Mordecai Kaplan in the early 20th century, kind of understood Judaism as a form of civilization. And so he interpreted the practices and rituals and prayer as ways of life that can be understood that are beneficial to people in a very kind of, you know, not, I don't wanna say mundane sense in a trivial way, but in a sense that makes us a living dynamic civilization and there are going to be some idiosyncrasies, including the prayers, including the languages that we have, including the rituals that we engage in, which actually can be defended without having any kind of mystical significance attached to them. Um, so I think that if Spinoza would have been like many Reformed Jews, that's why he was taken up by Reformed Jews, skeptical of the value of, of, of ritual and prayer as such, but there are elements of it which definitely can be defended in terms of the system. And in some ways, he just says, well, it's, it's inevitable that we think in these terms. Um, we're going to be attached to particular things and practices which are unique to us. So I think it's a super interesting question um, that comes out of his thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so hopefully that actually answers Saul's last question, or at least gives some color to the question about social cohesion. Um, and by the way, everyone, Kaplan is someone that I bet we'll get to next year in our Great Jewish Thinkers series. Yeah. Um, there were a couple of questions from Alex in the time that, are we okay to go a few more minutes? I'm happy to stay as long as you guys want, yeah. Okay, so a couple of questions that Alex put in the chat, one about the Bible and one about, about Christ. Um, I'll just read Alex's question in its entirety. Did Spinoza think the Bible was written by humans or from the mouth of God to the hand of Moses? If he thought of it as written by humans, wouldn't those be the imaginative ones? And if so, and if so, wouldn't for him, wouldn't it be for him a less important text to use to show that the Hebrews were chosen at a point in time? And then the second question, I think unrelated to that, was can you expand on his views on Christ? All right. Well, let me let me say something about the first one. That's a very good question. Um, yes. I mean, I think Spinoza believed um, that the the Bible was was written by humans. And this also made him a radical and a revolutionary. Um, in many of the chapters in the theological literatures, I didn't give you examples of it. He actually looks at the text and he makes, like he's very opposed to um, commentators like Rashi. You know, so I don't know if you've ever read Rashi. Rashi is a kind of a canonical medieval Jewish um, interpreter that that spends a lot of time looking at the meaning of particular words in the biblical text and how they cohere with other things. Um, and the general principle of interpretation that Rashi has, um, you know, in, in a simplified way would be to say, everything ultimately coheres in this text. So there's nothing that is a mistake. There's nothing that has, is a kind of random thing. There's nothing that, um, that doesn't have meaning that is ultimately part of the text. So the, the text is in a certain sense, an infallible transmission through Moses of God's word. Um, and it's for us to interpret it. And the principle of interpretation is that it's 
always correct. There's meaning in every part of it. And Spinoza um, disagrees with that. Uh, he just says, well, it's obvious that human beings put this text together. There's lots of places in the text and he points them out where like, he says, how could Moses write about his own death? That's just ridiculous. You know, so the, he attacks the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch, which of course was a radical view. Most Jews even now, of course, claim that miraculously Moses was able to write about his own death, etc. cetera. Um, uh, so many religious Jews, Orthodox religious Jews still believe in the, the mosaic uh, authorship of the text and therefore it was, came directly from God through Moses. And so it's just, uh, that's obviously absurd. And there are many passages in which we don't even know what the words mean. We can't claim to know what they mean because we don't have adequate philological evidence of what it would be. Um, and most of the uh, views that are that people think they understand it, they're just they're just they don't. They're just imaginatively reconstructing the meaning. Uh, and then he says it's obvious that it was edited, and it was edited by many different people. So this now we tend to think that the modern what's called higher criticism of the Bible is that the Bible was written. There are many sources and that editors put these sources together. There's the Deuteronomic source, the, the J text, and all these different kinds of sources. And they were edited together and then put together by editors into something coherent. And we can see that as evidence. Now, most many Orthodox religious Jews reject any kind of source criticism of the Bible now, just like religious many religious Christians do. But Spinoza initiates, along with other people in the 17th century, the possibility of looking at the biblical text as a partly human construct. Um, he thinks there's divine meaning in it, but the divine meaning is um, uh, gained when we interpret nature, uh, when we understand the Bible as a kind of interpretation of nature, right, through the imagination. So it's possible, it doesn't mean that the Bible is all wrong because it's written in this way by humans. Humans understand uh, the natural world around them. The Bible is a way to make sense of their relation to each other and to the natural world. So there's still meaning to be gained from it, but we can't assume that it, because it was written by humans, it's gonna be limited, partial, um, and not always uh, true. So that's kind of a super interesting point. And Spinoza goes at a great length to demonstrate this. And this got into him into a lot of trouble because this was a radical view at the time. Now, the other point about Christ is also really interesting. And this often upsets Jews, um, you know, because Spinoza thinks that Christ was this exemplary figure. Um, he thinks that Christ was a, was a kind of philosopher. He thinks Moses isn't a philosopher. He's just a great kind of um, uh, crap. He's, he has a great imagination and he's morally good, but he's not a philosopher. Christ, he thinks really is a philosopher. Um, but Spinoza's vision of Christ is extremely um, deflate, uh, deflationary, meaning that in the 17th century, there were huge debates about Christ. So for example, Spinoza's view of Christ is close to what there was a sect of Christians called Socinians. Socinians are maybe ancestors to modern uh, Unitarians, would probably be the closest Christian sect if you know uni uh, really philosophical Unitarians. I mean, there are some Unitarians that are more Christian, others that are more, you know, universalist. So Unitarian Universalists, if you if they have, you know, if you've ever encountered this particular sect of Christianity, they have an extremely um, human and kind of intellectual conception of Christ that strips Jesus of all mystical doctrines altogether. And there were sects like that in the 17th century. One famous example were Socinians. They were brutally persecuted by other Christian groups that just couldn't stand them because they thought that it eliminated all the mystery that was essential to the idea of Christ. There's no Trinity. There's no idea of virgin birth. There's none of this stuff that's usually associated with, with there's no miracles, etc. It turns Jesus into what later in the 19th century became like Jesus as a kind of great teacher, basically, you know, and that's Spinoza's view of Christ. So he thinks that Christ is a kind of teacher. But the other point he makes very strongly, and people often ignore this in reading Spinoza, he says that Christ never um, uh, undermined the Mosaic constitution. So he's very clear that that Christ is an important teacher. He has philosophical doctrines that we can learn from, 
but it never undermines the particular political and moral lessons of the Hebrew Bible. And so I think that that makes it a kind of, you know, interesting um, story. So yeah, so Spinoza has a very kind of interesting and challenging view of Christ. It would have been very radical for Christians at that time too, even what he said about Jesus. And then, uh, but the very fact, and he, but he never talks about Christ as a messianic figure, for example. So, and again, that's very consistent with Socinianism. So his idea of Christ is just simply as a teacher, the idea that Christ was a miracle worker, that he's the Messiah, that he's going to give people a chance to be resurrected in the afterlife. That for Spinoza is also just simply superstition. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I see one more question, then I think we've got to let you go because it's almost nine. Um, how did Spinoza's excommunicate? Sorry, my dog is barking at my son in the background. How did Spinoza's excommunication impact him personally, if we know that? Was it traumatic or welcomed? We don't really know. I mean, it, it, it's a very, uh, it's a super interesting question. I mean, one thing that you notice, I mean, Spinoza wrote letters. Uh, we do have some evidence about his life. But one thing that people didn't do in the 17th century that they now do, the literary and philosophical figures do, they really weren't confessional. Like they really weren't interested in kind of talking about their personal feelings about anything. They, they were very resolutely public in the way in which they wrote. So, you know, Spinoza's letters were written for public consumption in a way among other educated people. And you don't see a lot of um, talk, there's no talk about how he feels and if he's angry or upset or depressed, you would just never see that. On the other hand, a lot of his philosophy is devoted to what we would think of now in the ethics, um, not the theological political treatise, but the ethics is devoted to what we would think of as therapy. So Spinoza thinks you use reason to try to improve our mood as it were, to become better people and to live more joyfully. So I think that there's a lot of kind of indirect evidence that Spinoza was a kind of resilient person that tried to use reason to overcome what he called his uh, sad emotions, right? To, to favor joy over um, uh, sadness, uh, to have love over hatred. Uh, and there's a whole system of emotional therapy in part three and four of the ethics. I mean, I could give you a whole lecture on that another time if you want, uh, you know, I'm sure you've already had enough, but you know, in which he describes just this. So we can indirectly infer that Spinoza actually, like everyone else in, the, in, in human life, had a difficult life and overcame many things. Um, and part of the role of philosophy and indirectly of religion, he says at the end of the ethics that he's not undermined religion, religion still has an important role, is that it's supposed to foster a kind of life in which we can thrive as individuals and collectively. And, so, and part of that is our emotional lives. And so Spinoza was very attuned to that and had a lot to say about human emotions. So that's kind of, so, so you can imagine, right, that he was like, now there's a, there's a kind of less glorious image. I'll just maybe leave you, you know, there's one thing I can just mention. A apparently scholars have gone into looking at the history of the Amsterdam community. And one thing we know is that Spinoza's father's business went bankrupt. And so Spinoza and his brothers and sister inherited the father's business. And some people have claimed that Spinoza wanted to be excommunicated because that would free him from the debt that his father's bankrupt business and incurred on the rest of his family. So, you know, so it was kind of, it had a kind of practical dimension, which might have been freeing for him, freeing him of the constraints of a failed business, uh, among other things. But we just don't know. I mean, the harem, I mean, you know, we're often faced these days with people that want to boycott, sometimes boycott us as Jews or boycott people that we don't like politically or otherwise. Um, and we forget how harsh, a, how harsh a dictate this really is. And Jews have practiced various forms of banning or excommunication uh, since biblical times. And it meant, and it was as it was explicitly um, related in the, the script of, of banning or harem in this period against Spinoza is no one can have any connection with him whatsoever. Your family can't talk to you. You can't have any business relations. You can't go see your nieces and nephews. You know, they don't even want to talk to you. You can't even be present. 
And Spinoza did have to leave completely the community in which he was brought up in. Um, and that, that was a pretty harsh thing, you know? So um, I think we can understand at least some of his life uh, consequently is that kind of both, there's a kind of anger um, but there's also what's interesting about it against, against some of the religious institutions. You can see that a little bit in his work, but he's also exercising this kind of therapeutic principle, even in that too, I think, which he's trying to say, look, I realize these, these people persecuted me. They drove me out of the community. These are corrupt and problematic uh, beliefs that people have based on their false religious views, he thought. At the same time, you see him charitably trying to say, well, there may be something of value in it nonetheless. You know? And so I think that that kind of takes a lot of courage um, for someone who's been uh, you know, chased out to kind of still say, even those people that chased me out, there may still be something of value in their life, even if they didn't want to have anything to do with me anymore. You know? And that's kind of, that, that illustrates in a certain way his character. Um, but we don't have a complete portrait of the way he was as a person. Well, thank you. I want to thank you for being with us this evening. And by the way, watch out, because the last guy who offered to do another lecture with us ended up doing another lecture with us. So, I don't mind. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you guys are interested in this. I think it's very interesting. It's, uh, you know, I mean, one of the things about the philosophy is that it just repays endless. You can always go back to it. There's always new dimensions to look at, and it makes it very super interesting. Yeah, this has been fascinating and a perfect capstone to our time studying uh, Spinoza. So I want to thank uh, Professor Michael Rosenthal again for joining thank us you. this evening. It's been really interesting and really appreciate you taking the time to answer our questions and engage course, yeah. in the conversation. And, and we'll, we'll hope to be able to invite you in person the next time. I know. We do this. I know this um, is, it's it's really rough, yeah, to do it all in Zoom, but you guys are troopers. It's great. Yeah, this was great. So let me um, before we end, let me just say a quick thank you again to first of all everybody who joined us for any of the four sessions, and it was a great turnout. Uh, to all of those who um, who who donated toward this program, as well as our anonymous donor that sponsored uh, this module, and to the committee and the subcommittee, the adult ed committee and the, and the great Jewish thinkers subcommittee who helped us uh, put this program together. We are definitely planning to continue great Jewish thinkers next year and we'll figure out who we're gonna talk to and, uh, and what that will look like. And in the meantime, lots coming up adult ed wise. Uh, we have something coming up in June, I'll just mention briefly, that's called What Tevye Left, Be Left Behind, which will be an introduction to Yiddish culture and language. Uh, something very different from this, but but equally fascinating. And I'll hope to see many of you for Talmud study tomorrow morning, nine hours from now, or sorry, 12 hours from now, and uh, Torah study and all of, our, all of our usual stuff. So with that, I'll say good night. Thank you again, Professor Bye. Rosenthal, and thanks everybody for being here. Bye. Thank you, so wonderful. You're welcome. Thank you very much, that was very good. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, fascinating, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.